Uh, and you can see my slide. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. All right, great. Well, thank you guys for having me a uh, part of this experiment. Um, it's been really nice so far. And I'm looking forward to telling you about some of these results that we've been up to lately. Um, well, actually, uh, these results started, um, this work started over two years ago now with my collaborators uh, in Davis, Alec, Greg, and Jim. And uh, it's been a very kind of rich investigation. And uh, so we've had a lot of um, work we're continuing, uh, where I'm, I'm now in Singapore working with Neelay Gu. And uh, right, so, so my talk isn't actually about the thermodynamic uncertainty relations um, per se, but I think it'll have a similar spirit in that uh, we're talking about a trade-off between dissipation and reliability. And uh, in particular, if you want to compute uh, reliably and you're using a time symmetric protocol, it turns out that there's a divergent a dissipation as you uh, require more and more precision. So um, I think the, uh, the kind of ways that we've come up with this result are quite interesting and the final result we think um, might actually be quite important to real computers. So to start off here, I'd like to uh, just get us thinking broadly of what are the thermodynamic limits of computation? Well, for most people, that's going to bring Landauer's bound to mind that if you want to, uh, say, erase a bit, which for many people has been kind of synonymous with the thermodynamics computation, uh, compressing that state space uh, going from, uh, from equilibrium and compressing the state space in half will cost you something like kt log 2 of heat, and it will cost you in, say, work. So, you know, now I think given our advances in non-equilibrium thermodynamics, essentially we can see this as just a, a consequence of the, the second law of thermodynamics. So the fact that entropy production is non-negative on average. But then when we see it this way as a consequence of the second law, we also know that that bound is only going to be saturated in this quasi-static limit. And so if we're going infinitely slow and there's no control restrictions. So maybe that's not actually a very helpful bound. Um, so maybe what we meant to ask is something more like, what are the non-equilibrium thermodynamic limits of realistic computation? So by non-equilibrium, we mean something like finite duration. Realistic, we mean control constraints. So Landauer's bound is out. Uh, can we get stronger constraints on entropy production in this case? Uh, well, that's why we're here today. And in particular, I'm going to show that when you assume metastable memories, and also assume time symmetric control. These together imply an unavoidable error dissipation trade-off for any computation. So even more particular, the dissipation is going to diverge as you become more reliable. It'll scale as log of one over the acceptable probability of error epsilon. And then there's also a very interesting coefficient here, uh, which depends on the computation itself and on the time reversal symmetries of the memory elements. So that's also a new feature that we find quite interesting. To get there, let's consider the physics of memory systems and uh, of their transformation. Of course, there's many examples of, uh, of memory systems. I'll just kind of um, draw a line in the sand that may be useful. If we're talking about thermodynamic efficiency, uh, it's useful to uh, to tell the difference between volatile memory, which consumes energy uh, just to retain a memory, and non-volatile memory, which can robustly store the memory. So, uh, so we'll talk about non-volatile memories. If you want to talk about volatile memories, then there's probably going to be an additional housekeeping penalty on top of this. So what is a memory? Well, it must be physically embedded. It must have some physical representation. And you have some system that you want to be capable of storing a memory, then uh, the microstates of that physical system are going to be partitioned uh, into memory states. So to be 
a useful uh, sort of memory, you also want this memory to persist. So uh, the idea of uh, memories also goes hand in hand, typically, with this idea of metastability. And that basically is uh, invoking a separation of time scales, which is just natural in any memory system that we design. So uh, as you'll see in the figure here uh, with a bistable, uh, bistable well, um, this would be, for example, the, uh, the energy landscape induced by a particular control setting X naught. So the equilibrium distribution, pi X naught, uh, occupies both wells equally. Um, but what's really relevant in terms of memories are the local equilibrium distribution. So we don't care so much about the particular microstate, you just care that it's in the left. And in fact, knowing the detail of the microstate wouldn't help much because you uh, quickly come to local equilibrium, even though the approach to global equilibrium is much slower. So a matter of uh, notation I want to point out here is uh, when the distribution has a superscript, um, which is bracketed certain memory state. That means that the distribution is uh, restricted to that memory state, uh, the memory state L, uh, so it's restricted and renormalized. So to compute, you have to change your memory. So we wanna talk about the physics of transforming memory systems. In stochastic thermodynamics, we are familiar with the idea of control protocol. So for example, this would change the uh, metastable memory landscape. Uh, it would take it through some uh, transient control process. And uh, you can control the system Hamiltonian as well as potentially the, um, the coupling with the BADS. And by the end, you come back to the original uh, landscape and you will in general have induced a stochastic transition. Well, if we want our computers to actually work, then it shouldn't be so stochastic. Actually, we'll be especially interested here in the limit of nearly deterministic computations. So that's uh, with an error tolerance of epsilon. And then you get uh, to have just deterministic graphs explaining your computation. So I mentioned metastability already. Um, but if we're a little more explicit about what that means mathematically, that will help us to get to our main result. So metastability means that within each memory region, the local distribution is, uh, is, lo is uh, in local equilibrium initially, before the computation, and also after the computation, or at least shortly after the computation. So uh, that way, the, uh, the memory is robustly stored. What this allows us to do then is to describe the entire microstate distribution just in terms of a weighted sum of local equilibrium distributions. And that's very useful. So uh, an example you can keep in mind throughout uh, this process is, the, uh, is erasure. So we have this paradigm of erasure where you start in equilibrium. We can have just some time symmetric protocol where you vary the uh, height of one of the wells and can also control the barrier height. And this is sufficient to push probability density over into the left well more or less reliably. And uh, here, this is with underdamped Langevin dynamics, but it really doesn't matter. Whatever, the, whatever physical uh, instantiation you have, at the end of the day, there's going to be some net transformation that you can describe in terms of various probabilities between initial and final states. So let's talk about the uh, thermodynamics for our result. I try to keep it as general as possible. Um, we're actually able to derive our results either in the classical setting or in the quantum setting. Uh, the main assumptions are um, just that the system and any number of baths are initially uncorrelated and that any baths start uh, in local equilibrium. But the system itself can start in whatever state. So uh, this is also quite standard. The uh, entropy production is the entropy flow beyond any uh, compensating reduction in, in uh, system state surprisal. So 
this, when we take uh, expectation values, uh, would lead to the second law, which says that entropy production is expected to be non-negative. And when we look at the uh, equation here for entropy production, that immediately yields a general notion of Landauer's bound, that to uh, change the entropy of the system requires entropy flow. And to drive our main result, we uh, use a very nice general theorem uh, from Chris Draczynski in his 2000 JSTAT Phys paper, uh, where he introduces and coins this uh, detailed fluctuation theorem. And uh, it's basically, it's a, it's a very general result, I think actually underappreciated. You can have uh, any number of measurements on your system. So you have n measurements, say, of the uh, microstate of the system. The system and baths go through a joint Hamiltonian dynamic, and the entropy flow is constrained by the joint probability of forward state sequences and entropy flow versus the reversal. And really, there's no statement of uh, Markovianity here, uh, so, so this is uh, very, very general. Uh, as usual, Time reversal here is not just the, re the reversal of the order, but also the time reversal of the microstates themselves, for example, uh, flipping momentum. So entropy flow is very nearly entropy production. If we just tack on the change in surprisal, then we get an expression for entropy production in general. Although this is kind of a mess. Fortunately, we can I do a, just a little bit of algebra to write this in a way that the dependence on the microstate trajectory is basically isolated on one side. And I'll just say, uh, I'll focus on these top two distributions just to point out that there is an explicit dependence on uh, mu naught on the initial microstate distribution and also on mu tau dagger. That's the time reversal of the final distribution. And that's quite important. For the generality here. When you average, you immediately get the entropy production in terms of two relative entropies. Relative entropy is positive, so we can immediately get um, the relative entropy, the, the entropy production bounded just in terms of relative entropy of forward and reverse uh, microstate trajectories. So uh, many of you would recognize a formula like this, which has appeared many places, uh, but I, I want to emphasize as a, a technical point. Uh, that actually many other uh, places where a similar looking result has appeared actually had much stricter requirements of starting in equilibrium, which just doesn't work if you want to talk about initially having a memory, um, or considered non-equilibrium steady states. Um, but that would just be a special case for a result here. So uh, the dependence on mu naught and mu tau dagger is very important. We can then coarse grain, and coarse graining uh, then again bounds the entropy production. We coarse grain over both time and microstates to just look at probabilities of initial and final memory states. And this is good because it's getting us towards just knowledge of the computation telling us about uh, the thermodynamics. If we unpack this a little bit, we, we can see again the, de the dependence on the distributions and uh, when we notice that the relative entropy is only zero when both of these distributions, uh, both of its arguments are equal, we can rearrange things to then get this new relationship between physics and computation in general. So everything on the right side here is just something about the computation. And that tells us about the physics that we need to do that thermodynamically efficiently. And one of the features that appears here is the time reversal of the memory elements, uh, which, which implies that there's an important difference between using, say, conformational memory and something like magnetic memory. And this seems to be a new realization. Well, what about if you have practical constraints like time symmetry? Uh, this appears often, uh, for example, biological systems where uh, it's very viscous, low Reynolds numbers. You basically don't get momentum degrees of freedom. So everything's time symmetric. But even in our computers, uh, we have the, the high level signal uh, driving all computations is just some uh, clock signal, which is some time symmetric three gigahertz 
uh, square wave. And it just does the same computation over and over. Depending on what the memory in your computer is, it does something different, and then it does it again and does it again. So time symmetry is relevant, and metastability is relevant. So what happens when we apply those constraints? First, time symmetry of the driving protocol says that reversal driving is just the same as the forward driving. And metastability says that you start in local equilibrium. That happens on the left side and also on the right side. And there's a few other technical simplifications, which then allow us to recognize that those prob these probabilities are actually the transition probabilities of the computation itself. So now we're bounding dissipation in terms of what the computer actually does. We can rewrite this in terms of a Landauer looking uh, change in memory entropy. And also in terms of, again, uh, probability transitions that the computer should actually do going between different memory states. Let's also consider uh, high reliability. And this basically says, the way to um, quantify this is say, any transition that should happen, if M should go to M prime, then it should happen with probability greater than one minus epsilon. If that transition should not happen, then it should happen with probability less than epsilon. So this has important implications because you'll notice these three transition probabilities here uh, will basically either be one or epsilon. So there's four cases to consider depending on whether the computation is supposed to take you from M to M prime or not. And also if the computation should take you from M prime to M or not technically about whether it takes you from M prime dagger to M dagger, which is the time reversal, which matters for magnetic memories. So all of these cases end up being uh, just contributions on the order of epsilon, except for this case two. And in this case, you get divergent dissipation that scales as log of one over epsilon. And so you incur this one over epsilon uh, penalty every time you start in a memory that is non-reciprocated. That is, when you start in a memory that the computation takes somewhere that it doesn't take back to itself. And uh, again, this is diverging as you're requiring more reliability of your computation. This can also be written in terms of work. And let's think about uh, what is this reciprocity requirement? Well, it's different than logical reversibility. It's really a new type of requirement. Uh, for simplicity, let's think about uh, time reversal symmetric memories, so like positional memory. Then you can have uh, reciprocated transitions, but you can also have logically reversible permutations, which are not reciprocated and are still going to cost you divergent dissipation. So to get to an example, um, Let's talk about erasure, and let's talk about erasure by any means. So however it's physically implemented, I mentioned you're gonna have some uh, stochastic uh, transition from initial to final memory states. So if you do an exact analysis, you get this relation up top. And if you apply our uh, low error analysis, then you'll see that you get a log of uh, one over error rate uh, penalty whenever you start in the right uh, well, which you will never get back to upon iteration of the computation. We can consider physical instantiations of this, for example, Arrhenius rate dynamics. And you'll see that as reliability increases, the Landauer's bound saturates. But the error dissipation trade-off is actually leading to divergent dissipation as the error is becoming smaller. Similarly, with underdamped Langevin dynamics, we sample many different time symmetric protocols. And as error, uh, error decreases, Landauer bound saturates, but you have to pay more and more dissipation if you have metastable memories transforming under time symmetric protocols. OK, everyone talks about erasure, but what if we actually want to talk about computation? Maybe a good start at that would be a two input, one output logic gate. For example, the NAND gate is universal, so let's talk about that. When you want to talk about the memory, 
you have to talk about the memory that exists at any given time. And so you have to talk about the memories that hold the input as well as the memory that will hold the output. You have to consider those all inclusively. So we have three bistable elements in this example that will implement the NAND gate and the output bit will be overwritten with the NAND computation. And basically you can see then what the NAND uh, operation does is in each row, there's basically an erasure of the output bit. Um, depending on whether the output bit was already what it should be or not. So it looks like erasure, but then when you look at how often you incur non-reciprocity, it actually depends on initial correlation between the uh, memory elements. So overall, you'll get a log of one over epsilon uh, penalty for accuracy, um, but there's an interesting correlation dependence there, whereas lambda or bound is uh, saturated. Is this relevant really uh, for computations? Um, well, we just do a back of the envelope calculation and we find that actually it seems like uh, this, uh, our result leads to about 30 KT of dissipation per logic transformation in your computer. So this is way over Landauer's bound. Uh, it's over 40 times Landauer's bound. So if you think that you care about Landauer's bound, you need to care about this error dissipation trade-off first. Similarly, in biological systems where you don't get any momentum degrees of freedom, uh, you're gonna encounter this um, error dissipation trade-off. And maybe this helps explain why uh, ATP going to ADP actually releases so much energy of, it's hard to get a good estimate, but say 12 to 25 KT. So how are we gonna avoid this? Well. How about we just use less reliable components and do error correction? Well, no, that's not gonna work. Actually, Alec and I worked, worked out in general that the scaling uh, is in, not in your favor and you, you just can't avoid the error dissipation trade-off. Well, um, except that Alec will give a talk tomorrow, uh, which gives some hint of that maybe we can actually engineer the time reversal symmetries of the memory elements for computation. So you should tune in tomorrow for Alec's talk. Alternatively, we're left with these possibilities of using time asymmetric control or using inertial computing where we avoid metastability. And these are really interesting topics that we're pursuing now. So uh, looking forward to your questions and continued uh, discussion on this.